Welcome to my Bewitching Podcast, where I take you on a journey to initiate you into the mysteries and pleasures of all things magical and more. I'm Julie Nelson, Rich Witch, botanical perfumer, astrologer, and creator of the Fragrant Oracle. I'll discuss a myriad of topics passionately on women rising unapologetically, witchcraft, including spells, rituals, insightful astrology updates, and oracle card readings. I'll also introduce you to special guests who share their bountiful knowledge and experience in the art of witchcraft, the intuitive and healing arts, and being wildly unapologetic. There is something so evocative about the power and pleasure of scent and what it conjures from within us. Mother Earth speaks to you through her flowers and trees, herbs and fruits. You feel a deep connection rising from within you when you are tuned into her magic. You've experienced her enchantment and now you're ready to be inspired by the fragrant oracle. These cards carry the essence of woman of the world, both ancient and modern, witches, priestesses, goddesses, the essence of you. As I introduce you to each of these cards, think of them as your companion to rising unapologetically in your divine feminine essence to support you in creating magic in your life. Unleash your goddess essence and weave your magic. Today's fragrant goddess with her redolent scent and passionate energy easily and effortlessly activates your body, mind and spirit. Allow me to introduce you to cardamom. I am your motivation, your sense of freedom, your inner goddess. I will both sweeten and excite you, for I bring a rousing passion into your essence of being. I will free your spirit and unleash your femme energy so you can shimmer with life force. Conjuring me means you're ready to release all that no longer serves you. I will guide you in moving forward with a playful sense of freedom in the dance of life. I assist you in achieving a vivifying mind and heart to captivate your audience in any situation. Combine these following affirmations as you inhale my scent to initiate your sacred magic. I am wild and free. I am spirited. I evoke heartfelt passion. I am courageous. I am enchantingly playful. I am here today with a beautiful woman whom I've known for quite a long time. We're separated by a massive ocean <laughs> and we're on different timelines, of course. And we are very passionate about the same things. Elizabeth Ashley Stand, and I'm going to hand you over to her so she can introduce herself. And then we're going to get into some 
talks about working with essential oils intentionally. So, Elizabeth, welcome. Thank you so much, Julie. It's so nice to be here. Those of you who don't know me, I write under the name Elizabeth Ashley. Ashley is my middle name, but it is my writing name. And I write the Secret Healer Aromatherapy Manuals, of which there are 23. And I talk about the mind, body and spirit of essential oils. And so we'll be talking about using them magically today. Absolutely. And I'm so looking forward to this. And yes, um, I will put... Elizabeth's note, uh, sorry, not notes, um, information in the show notes so you can buy her her books and follow her and talk to her and whatever you like. Oh, and she's got a fabulous um, Facebook group. What is it? Wart Cunning? Wart Cunning Moon Bathing and Crones, a place for magical Melissa priestesses. I love it. I love it. I love it. I knew I wouldn't remember the whole name, but I do like it. It's fun. It's fun. It's like the other day, you know, it kept coming up and it was like, what's blooming in your garden or something? I can't remember. And I went, not a bloody thing because you're in you're you're in the warmer <laughs> weather and we've we're coming out of the dormant season and it was like, it's, it's right and the only thing is julie it's miserable here we're about the same temperature <laughs> we're not oh. having much of a summer at all this year in the uk <laughs> oh well i ho- oh i hope it gets better for you because we haven't had a decent summer for a couple of years either so I'm really hoping that's going to change. We need it <laughs> for joy and happiness and feeling good. And it reminds me, I want to share something. I was coming back from my unicorns yesterday and they're about a 45 to 50 minute drive away. So for those of you that don't know, I have five mini horses, but I've always called them unicorns. And I've got them in a jisment down in a little valley from where I live. And I have to come up the mountain. So as I was coming up the pass last night, just at dusk, I had the sun setting directly behind me. Of course, I did twists and turns in that. But most of the time, the sun was setting behind me. So there was this beautiful hue of yellow, gold and apricot orange and directly in front of me was the moon. And oh, how she, lovely. She's a super moon and the sky was this beautiful pastel lavender moving into the soft blue. So for those of you that may not know, we're coming, we're about to step into a full moon in Aquarius and it is a super full moon. So it means that she looks much bigger in the sky because she is actually closer to earth and she is opposing or they are opposing each other, the sun and moon and the sun is in Leo, of course. So when you see them in the sky coming up, they're directly opposite each other. And it is magical. And I thought, right now, if I weren't driving and I could, I would lie down in the desert and I would have the moon and the lavender and the blues coming up on one side of me and on the other, the golden hues and the orange setting and going down. And I just thought, oh, that would be so delicious. Anyway. (laughs) Totally got off track, but I do a lot of moon magic as well, and I follow the moon, so it's very beautiful to witness these phenomena. And I I call them phenomena because there's so much magic around us at all times. So I invite you to open your eyes and see what's there and invite that magic into your heart. So we have got a beautiful topic on essential oils to discuss on being very, very clear with your intentions for spell crafting or if you don't work with spells, having 
intentions for each day, for weekly, for monthly, and even for hourly. It might even be to right now I am feeling joy. So then I'd go to my cabinet. If I want to invoke that, I would go to my cabinet and pull out one of my favorite essential oils that I know as soon as I smell it, it's going to bring a smile to my face. I'll immediately relax and I will be in sensual bliss. But we need to understand the properties, don't we, Elizabeth? We do, definitely. And as I said earlier, that essential oils can be used in so many different ways for physical healing, which is kind of most of the internet now, <laughs> emotional and mental healing, but spiritual and even soul kind mm. of healing, you know. Um, I talked to Julie mentioned my group and I said that it was a group of magical Melissa priestesses. The Melissa priestesses are bee priestesses from antiquity and they were I spent the last four years studying them and five years in fact. And they worked with plants and were almost like shapeshifters into plants you see in the stories, how Persephone's nemesis in the underworld was a nymph who had been changed. Uh, into a plant her name was Minte and there was uh, Daphne who was a um, a priestess who changed into a tree at Delphi and also perhaps the most famous uh, shapeshifter of them all was Mira she became a, a mercury after she was um, cursed by Aphrodite and so when I was studying the thing that I was most fascinated with was what what's going on here What's going on with this shapeshift? Is this just a myth? Because there definitely are still Melissa priestesses. They, uh, when the, the pagan sanctuaries were closed in 391 AD by the uh, Emperor Theodosius, some fled, some ended up in Scandinavia, some ended up in Lithuania. Um, and some, uh, Melissa work is still intact in Lithuania, but also um, in round by me in England, in Wales. I live right on the border of um, of England and Wales. And do you find uh, the priestesses at Glastonbury are called Melissa? Mm. So this link with the bee still exists. But the question to me was, does this shape shift still exist? Mm. And what I came to understand was what they were doing was learning to embody the plant, to almost become the qualities of the plant, to be able to heal somebody or to do psychopunk work or even just like to be with somebody at the worst time. So if somebody was dying or if somebody was in transition in labour, that they were able to manifest this fantastic energy of myrrh usually to turn up for that person. So when we talk about that kind of magic, in relation to what we read on the internet of setting the intention, you're like, that. that's worlds apart. So where's the knowledge that exists in between that? And uh, as a writer and as an English person, I am very specific about the way that words are used. Oh, <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> very annoyed by words that lose their we their meaning so for example awesome ladies and gentlemen is not a chicken nugget it's just not it <laughs> is very annoyed definitely by not <laughs> <laughs> i've got a, i've got a son who goes around saying everything's awesome no it's not <laughs> but but to me this idea of setting an intention is almost getting like that because we use we don't think about the words that we're using and words have power so one of the most prominent melissa sites in the ancient world was at the temple of ephesus which was in asia minor which is now turkey mm. and funnily enough julie you'll like this um artemis of Eph ephesus was worshipped as a bee at the full and new moons so so these are like special times within there the the head beekeeper the sorry the head priestess was called 
the beekeeper and the priests there were eunuchs and they were called drones and the priestesses mm-hmm. were Melissa. And the key uh, doctrine that was uh, thought there was called the Logos. Now, what's interesting is Ephesus turns up in the Bible lots of times. So, of course, we have the letter to the Ephesians from St. Paul. Um, and when he's there, you actually see the story of what happens in the Acts of the Apostles. He goes to Ephesus and he gets into a terrible row with the silversmiths there because what they're doing is making little uh, models of the goddess and making inordinate amounts of money because this is like a sanctuary where everybody comes to see the priestesses. So they're actually in the Bible that you see them there. But what's really interesting is so you've got the four synoptic gospels, haven't you? You've got Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. Matthew, Mark and Luke are kind of like stories of what happened to Jesus. But John's different. It's like a theological book. And it begins with really famous words, doesn't it? In the beginning no, was the word. Mm-hmm. In the beginning was the word and the word was God. That's, that's how it begins. Now, that was written in Ephesus. And that is the Logos. So in other words, the power of God or the power of spirit is through your words. Yes. So this idea of intention, we have to really understand how it moves through our body. So you also think we'll say we set our intention. So set is a really interesting word as well. So would you believe set has... 24 different meanings in the English language. So this was a game when I was little, and I could probably reel off 16 if I tried, but I could never do 24 all at one go. But we'll, we'll, we'll think of a couple off the top of our heads. First of all, like a jelly set, doesn't it? Of course. And you have like a badger's set. That was always important to me. There was a badger's set at the bottom of my granddad's garden, so that was an important word to me. You have a a set of books, set of cards. So we could have a set of intentions, actually, couldn't we? What are the set of intentions that we're going to work with? So now that has meaning. But for me, when I was a child and when I learned the word the most, and so therefore how it sits in my body, my mum used to say to me every, every night at 20 past six, please, will you set the table? So, or we could say place our intention, same kind of thing. Can you put the place settings out? So this idea of setting in my body is like almost like putting a mat down, right? Mm -hmm. Putting your knives and forks down. But it it has no sense of power whatsoever. It doesn't, does it? I mean, that's like... There is another, there is another version of set that my body also knows. And that is, I was quite a good archer as a girl. So then you set your trajectory. Oh, now that is active. Yes, I love that. Very Artemis too. Exactly. exactly. I am, of course, an Artemis lady. But so this whole idea of I set my, my journey. So when we set our intention, do we? how are we feeling that in our body? How is it turning up? Um, um, and so this now becomes an active vibration. Mm-hmm. So... Also, when we're writing, at the moment, set the table is passive to me. It's boring. It's got, well, and also, like, I've been told to do it. I didn't, do, I didn't choose to do it. Yeah. And, that, exactly. and that, so that's how it feels in my body. So also, when you're writing, what you'll find is you can either write in the, the, the um, active tense or the passive tense. Well, intention is a word that can be passive. So, again... That's not magical. Mm-hmm. That's not magical. So what we're thinking about here is, right, so we intend to do something. We, we, we tell the oils what we intend to do. So take passive out of it. We intend to do this. Yes. We focus on this. We direct this. We command this. We order this. Yes. All my words. Yes. All of those make magic work differently it empowers it it um it powers it up it enhances it and i think we become more aligned it's all well invoking we yeah exactly which means that we're taking we're embodying it from exactly 
exactly so this idea so so really taking time to think about how does that turn him up, up in my body how can i shift that, that energy because when it comes down to it that is what magic is it's about transforming energy Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. we have a healing magic where we transform the energies of the cells or we transform the energies outer in the universe so to do that we need to really think about doing it in an active way now what's weird is we can command and direct the uses of the essential oils to do that mm-hmm. or we can use the essential oils to take us to a place where we're already in an active it's already happening and we can use that trajectory so we're almost like so the difference between two magical people for example we might say titania or buddhika so titania magic happens to her Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. she's not active in that but buddhika she overthrew the the uh, the whole of the roman empire in, in england and she did that by setting the trajectory of her her uh, yes. chariot and so and of course chariot is like the ultimate magical image mm-hmm. in in like roman and and, and grecian uh, magic you always even even selene the, the goddess of the moon she is seen on her chariot across the sky so this idea of it there being a, an ordained path that path has been ordered, that path has been co- coordinated. And so, well, I say, and so might it be, because that's what it's going to become, because it's already been set in the future. Yes. Um, and and like you said, you know, you can pick an essential oil who that will take you to a jo- joyful place. I want to be joyful, and it's really hard to imagine how I'm going to be joyful. But Orange goes, here it is, here it is. This is where you need to be. Yes, yes. Or yeah. if you want to, like, embody, well, let's say, I'm not going to say, should we say Aphrodite? kind of wanted to be something a little bit less, more lascivious than that. We'll say, we'll say Aphrodite, but, you know, like, yeah. real lust, real juicy lust. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And Jasmine goes, here I am. Oh. <laughs> you know, she's got a whole different voice, hasn't she? She moves, she moves the voice down into the guttural, orgasmic zones whereas mandarin's all playful she's up here you know straight away the goddess moves through you she goes i'm here i'm here yes and so yeah this idea of setting an intention is a two-way thing that you say this is what i wanted to do and the oil says let me show you let me show you where your starting point is Mm. oh my gosh i could listen to you speak about um the goddesses and oils all day because it's something that I work a lot with and I think well I don't think I'm going to say to be able to invoke and there is a difference between evoke and invoke um, is that invoking is truly embodying it becoming it and it is important to understand the qualities of the essential oils yes you can intuitively choose yes you can um pick up one and inhale it and take notice of how it makes you feel and there's nothing wrong with that when you have that very clear intention for me, it's much more powerful and you're more likely to receive the result, the spell, the intention, much faster, perhaps more powerfully. So what I often do is, so this is a ritual and I've talked about this many, many, many times and it ties into what you were saying And it's such a simple ritual and I give it to my clients all the time because I work with the magic of perfume, natural perfumery, is that you put a drop on your wrist, you inhale it, you command your intention or your spell, you inhale your perfume again. And from a a science perspective, um 
perspective, it's anchoring it into your brain so that when you continue to speak, uh, smell that perfume and you may have to do it a few times with your intention it, after it's kind of locked in and anchored in there every time you smell your perfume you're conjuring that desire which I think is a really beautiful way to work and I do use the essential oils to conjure the qualities or energy, the archetypal energies of a goddess. I have some. I have um, the secrets of Venus. I have Kiskalilla. Kiskalilla is the Samarian goddess that we know as Lilith. And last year I actually was working, and early this year I was working with Artemis. She kept coming up in oracles and I kept hearing about her so I worked with her and it was about pointing my arrow in the direction of where I wished to go and you you land there it it you shape shift into it <clears throat> and I love I were actually I'm going to ask you and we will put it in and I should know because I get the emails, but do you have a book specifically on the bees and those priestesses and or do you bring it into all different of your book writings with the different oils? Um, so that's a kind of yes and no answer. Uh -huh. So I began starting working or or Sibeli, who was like the oldest um be goddess that we know turned up for me in around about 2018 so anything pre written pre that does not ha even mention a bee priestess because i'd never heard of one mm -hmm. um so then i spent four years trying to write a book on lemon balm we talking about the priestesses in there and it refused to be written in the way that i wanted it mm -hmm. and eventually i got to the end of it but it was absolutely colossal and the only way that I could get it published was to split it down into two, to take the herbal medicine out and to publish the priestess's book on its own. So the herbal medicine about the about lemon balm, which does talk about the bee priestesses, is already on sale. And it's called Melissa Officinalis. Um, But the one that's specifically about all the research that I did, all of the... Well, with that, I'll give away a secret. All of like the acupuncture stuff that I discovered because bees and acupuncture is a thing. All of that com is in the book called Meeting the Melissa, which comes out at the end of September. Ooh. But it is available for pre order, so please do pre order it. <laughs> okay, well, definitely. And I'll be sharing that for you in my community Thanks. because. Thanks, uh, Jen. Yeah, that's powerful. I'll have to get it myself. So did you have to let go of the herbal medicine aspect or that's the second book? The book That one's already on sale. That came out last year. Okay, right. Thank you. Sorry. I needed to clarify that. I am absolutely fascinated with this and now I feel like I may go down a rabbit hole. I want to talk with you more about it. Perhaps if we pick... Can we can we choose one and just have go into depth with her a little bit? Perhaps Mur? One oil. One oil, oh Mur. Mm. Well, Mur is actually who I'm writing about now. So mm. that's so that's funny really, because I have like real vivid thoughts about Mur. And, and you know, Again, we talked about the Bible earlier, and of course, myrrh is in the Bible. It's mentioned more times than any other plant uh, mm -hmm. in the Bible. And but it, it has like really disparate sort of uses. Um, so on one hand, you've got it given to the baby. Of course, we don't need to be loose out any more than that. We have it uh, uh, turning up as the oil that they embalm Christ with after um, he died. We um, have it then, we have it as like this deep aphrodisiac in Song of Songs. Mm -hmm. We have it in the Book of Esther. Now, so what's really interesting to me that's replaying on my mind at the moment is Song of Songs and Book of Esther 
Mer is in both, and, and God is nowhere to be found in either of them. So it's almost like we're talking about the goddess, but nobody wants to say it um, outright. And the book of Esther, what's interesting is she's been brought up, in case anybody doesn't know the story of Esther, it's she's a, a Jewish girl who... Um, her parents have died. She's been bought. She's been raised by her uncle, who is a Sanhedrin, so he's a really high up um, Jewish priest. And they, a command comes from the Persian court. The king has got rid of his wife because she stopped doing what she what he wanted her to do. He's asked her to appear at a a, a dinner wearing wearing her crown, but you kind of think maybe he asked her to wear nothing but her crown. So she absolutely says, no, I'm not doing that. And he banishes her, executed her, we don't know. But an mm-hmm. edict comes that needs a new queen. And so Esther is is sent. Um, I can't remember what her Jewish name was. She's not Esther at that point, but she, she is uh, Esther. And so she's sent to the harem. And the, this edict is passed that she, that she has to be, uh, to use myrrh for six months and then perfumed oils. Mm. And so you know how like you you look at something and you know, I know something's there, but what am I seeing? What am I seeing? Mm -hmm. And it really seems to me that, you know, everybody translates that as she was told to use perfumed oils, but but she wasn't. She was told to use myrrh and then perfumed oils. So to me, it's almost like, it was checking that she she was tight enough because that's how they they use it in Africa to tighten the vagina and make sure there's no no nasty STIs. God forbid there's another baby lurking somewhere, you know. So this wow. cleansing is you know, and so it's written in the book. It's definitely it's there in the Bible, but nobody wants to visit that. But if you know about murder, then you have to say that that's not perfuming. The next six months is perfuming. Yes, um, yes, yes. So, so that so that's really fascinating to me. But also, it, in Egypt, it was probably the most famous and most important um, of all the uh, all of the treatments. And you'll see, it's associated with lots and lots of different gods, lots and lots of uh, different goddesses. But specifically at Dendera, we find that Hathor is the mistress of Mer. Yeah. So we talk yeah. about Hathor as being the energy of joyfulness. We mm-hmm. talk about her being death. Oh, wait a minute. That's the same as Myrrh again. And she's she's also drunkenness. Now, we don't specifically want to talk about uh, the, the physical properties of Myrrh. But what I can tell you is it works in the same way as morphine, works on the same receptors, and clinically proven to be 10% as strong as morphine. Well, still strong, still makes you feel a bit drunk. Mm. Um, and But also Hathor is a really complex deity in her own right, and she splits down into lots of deities too. So Hathor came about because the... the um, Armon wanted was sick of the humans not doing what they were supposed to do. They weren't giving um pedants to sacrifices and taking notice of the gods anymore. So he decided he was going to destroy them. The council, he council of gods said enough. So he um sent uh, sent Sekhmet to destroy them. And Sekhmet is bloodthirsty. And she goes over the top, really. There's this huge, massive blood rush. And it's like if somebody doesn't stop Sekhmet, then there's going to be no humans left. So he he tricks her. He gets the goddess of beer to make this beer that turns that is red, which to me sounds like it may have been soaked with with myrrh because myrrh would turn it red and then she falls asleep and the beautiful benign Hathor uh, comes from that but also so think about the association with the blood well that's Mm -hmm. a myrrh thing you know the periods and you know but also it's styptic and it stops wounds so 
and you could and I could go on for ages. You know, you can I could I've been able to go that goddess, that goddess, that goddess associated with Hathor, associated with Mur, associated with Hathor, associated with Mur. So what we're seeing here is the divine the divine feminine, you know, that this is the embodiment of the divine feminine. Oh, I love that you're speaking my words and oh my God, I'm just like what an amazing topic and I've always loved myrrh. I think it is absolute pure magic in a bottle and what I mean by that is it it's um it's it does so many things it is rich in its qualities and a phenomenal oil um and now um you know, many years ago, I wanted to do a range called Murha, and um, I just never did it. But it was always there because I love all of those oils, and I feel that fire in Myrrh as well because of the red, the reddish color. So the different energies. So with what you've shared, um, it's very important to understand the oils so that when we are conjuring, commanding in what we desire or a, an intention, we it's important to, to understand the tools that we are working with. And I consider essential oils to be one of my most powerful tools. I use them every day. They are a part of my everyday life. They are a part of my healing. They are a part of my magic. They are me, to be honest with you. I've always called them my best friends, you know, because I have such an intimate relationship with them. And I, I feel that's you as well, Elizabeth. I'm feeling that it would be wonderful to have an, another conversation with you or two or three, whatever you feel like. And perhaps you might like to read little excerpts from your books to help people get to know them and then we can see what that leads into with magic and with healing um, and whatever it may bring. So I, I would love that. Thank you. Yeah, I'm feeling that oh, would good. that would be very powerful for our listeners. And also we, being passionate aromatherapists, we want to educate people in the right way and really understanding essential oils and how to use them. Of course, in saying that, what I do want to say, this is my, my practitioner hat coming on, is that we are only, not only because magic is incredibly powerful and it is a lifestyle to be that magician, that priestess, the goddess, the witch, the woman of the modern world and essential oils. It's very important to respect them and, and to respect them fully and honour them. It is important to learn about them and... I feel it's very important, like I will not talk about how they can heal us on a physiological level because I feel that um, is where you need to seek the advice of a qualified aromatherapist because of all of the poisoning reports we've had in Australia. I don't know what it's like where you are, Elizabeth, but... Um, in Queensland, they even put out a um, a warning, a document, because there's been so many poisoning reports from misuse. So working with the magic, you don't even have to apply them. You can dry inhale them from the bottle, which is absolutely safe. And learn about those beautiful energies of their magic. I mean, they are magic. Their, their whole, I'm going to say being, their whole energy is magic because um, I don't think of them as 
a liquid in a bottle or just essential oil. They hold so much. So I want to ask you before we wrap up, do you have, now when people ask me this, I go, oh, my God, it's better to ask me what I don't like. But just three oils off the top of your head would be maybe whether they're your favourites right now or all-time favourites. What are your three? Still, you talked about having been your best friend. So definitely, I definitely think they're like friends to me. I call them my healing clique. Mm, that, uh, turn up, turn up over and over again. So, my my favorite. If I had to go to a desert or island, do get asked that a lot. Mm -hmm. Then geranium would would go with me. Um, mm. She has so many physical benefits, and incidentally, of course, I'm the opposite end of the scale to you. I teach lots online about the physical uh, benefits of essential oils, but but she's a very safe oil. You know, it's very hard to misuse um, geranium, but she's also, you know, the, the probably the, the ultimate divine feminine is, is Rose. In so many different ways, geranium can be, she's like the understudy of the queen, mm. if you like. You know, she's, she's the embodiment of Venus. And so because Venus, we don't have, not only have beauty and love, we also have money. And so yeah. that's a really, really helpful oil to me, especially if I'm kind of a person that stresses a lot about money. Um, mm -hmm. And so geranium is very good at going, just let it drift away. You've got a drop of, of geranium in the bath when you're feeling stressed about money is fantastic. Mm -hmm. uh, my pick ass oil, the one that kicks my ass the most is sweet basil. You know, so there's, I don't really, there's a lot of bossy oils that I don't like. I don't like peppermint. I don't like rosemary. They're too much like me. They're too much bossing people about. <laughs> but but I wouldn't even dare answer sweet basil back. <laughs> She's yeah. like a sergeant major pushing me out the plane. And so, I mean, a lot of people say to me, I, I would love to do the kind of work that you do, but I really suffer from imposter syndrome. I get it. I really suffer from imposter syndrome, but Sweet Basil goes, get out there anyway. Um, yeah. And so I find that a really, I mean, I wrote a book about her and I call her the oil of empowerment, but actually she's the oil of, I don't give a stuff about what you think. The universe wants you to do that. She's <laughs> so, very airy. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Aries rising as well. I am. So, there you go. Um, and uh, what else? Third one. Galbanum, probably. Nice. Mm. So Galbanum is is so. I, I am, even though I am a, an intrepid spiritual adventurer, you know, I'm be, somebody very insightfully said I'm like the Marie Curie of essential oils. You know, I <laughs> embody. I, I sink under it for like years and years and years till I understand it. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, I am a spiritual wuss. So quite a lot of times there's like a, a strong sense of I just want to run away from this. Whereas Galbanum goes, keep your feet to the fire. You will get you through it. And you do learn to be a fire walker with it. And oh, I mean, yeah. on, a, on a physical level, it's so good at stopping things turning poisonous. So, mm -hmm. you know, if you've got like ulcers and abscesses and stuff like that, but on a spiritual level, it works that way as well. You know, this is exciting, and it's not, and it, and it, it might turn a bit frightening, but it will turn out. We'll we'll get you through to the other side. So I find galbanum to be a really helpful magical oil. So we've got geranium and basil. So geranium is a Libran oil, and Venus rules. So I know she's spoken of as being an earth oil too. Um, but I relate her to um, Libra, and Libra, of course, is ruled by Venus, as is Taurus. So I see geranium's always been one of my all-time favourites. Because I am a Libra fivefold, geranium is fantastic for bringing me <laughs> into balance, and I love bathing in geranium. Um, sweet basil, I, I'm not in love with the aroma, but I love the essence, the energy, the warrioress 
of Basil and being Aries. Aries is the warrior, the doer, the action taker, the motivation. It's don't fuck around. We're going to do this. So I love that. I love the Basil Tulsi. However, that's not as fiery. It's more on that spiritual realm. And Galbanum, yes. Okay. So mine, okay. Well, I'm going to leave geranium out because you have spoken about her. Jasmine, for me, is a signature oil. I see Jasmine as ruled by the moon so she is the mermaid the shapeshifter and I've always had this vision of her you know she's dancing and playing in the ocean with the whales and the dolphins and the octopi and the moonlight shining down on the ocean and you know she's playing a harp or a little mandolin uh, you know just all that beautiful fantastical mermaid imagery that's conjured all of the time but I've always seen her swim to shore and as she swims to shore her she becomes a goddess the goddess of jasmine and she's in this white almost translucent sparkling gown and her fishtail becomes the fishtail the trail of her gown and she walks from water to land and she's got long dark hair so she's got that sultriness when she's on land so um jasmine is very sexy for me i adore her but i love that connection with the moon as well for me um rose of course Okay, I'll go with a fiery one because I do love black pepper. And again, I feel she is the warrior woman, but not quite as full on as Basil. But again, very sexy and seductress, uh, the seductress and warming, very warming and motivated. And she's like there, ready. Whereas she... Black Pepper to me is like the warrioress that's standing ready for battle, whereas Basil's already gone in there. It's like <laughs> you've missed the boat. There he's Basil's already gone. Um, my nickname is Julie Patchouli because patchouli is just a scent that I live with because it is medicine in a bottle like myrrh. Um, and frankincense and so many of them, the the different qualities and and um, I've always carried um, patchouli with me because it's a great emergency oil. However, I love the, it's for me, patchouli is very earthy and fiery. So it's got that grounded connectedness However, also it's like the passionate aspect of patchouli. Not so much the warrior, but more that sexy, passionate. So this is my Scorpio coming out because anything sexy and seductive and, you know, Lilith energy, I love. Scorpio. Um, yeah, so they're three, but I also, oh, my gosh, I could rattle off a list. But what's been popping into my mind while we've been saying this is labdanum. I adore labdanum. And as I mentioned on, see, this is what happens with me. I'll start rattling off a whole lot of others. Um, Champaka would be one of my ultimate oils. I, yeah. Do, do you know, I knew you were going to say that because I know you like champaka. And I thought, oh, I'll tell Julie this. So this uh, behind me was somewhat chaotic at the weekend. I'd had so many different reasons to have oils out and I never put them away. So I just shoved them in a box. And <laughs> down between the books, I'd found it, there was this tiny, tiny little bottle of oil. And I thought, what are you? Champaka. Oh. And I thought, that's, that's a... And then straight away, I was like, oh, Julie on Wednesday. <laughs> I don't know what found it. It was like the oils went, don't forget. <laughs> <laughs> absolutely absolutely and that's conjuring isn't it you know they it come out, it's like i am here so um, you're talking about uh, ja about jasmine 
it was really well actually did you realize that you kind of described the story of the the origins of um Aphrodite when you were telling that story no so according to Hesiod uh the uh, the mother goddess Gaia was completely sick of being pregnant um, and Uranus was having none of it. He wanted more children, more children, more children. So mm-hmm. she went to Kronos, mm-hmm. her son, and she said, you need to do something about this. So he sat and thought for a while. Then he got a, a sickle and he lopped his father's rutting phallus off. And funnily, enough where the blood fell on the ground were the first nature spirits the Meliades who would become the Melissa according to him and he threw the phallus into the water and from there rose this sea goddess Mm -hmm. and she came out of a shell of course that's the uh, Botticelli painting isn't it birth of Venus and as she came on to land her um, her train had all the birds, the bees buzzing behind her and fertility followed her and she bought the flowers. It was almost exactly the story you told in a different way. So that was really like strong imagery. And of course, you know, it is Aphrodite and energy, isn't it? Yes, um, absolutely. And I've had a lot of visions with the oils and for years have been telling the visions that I get from them and it's how I relate to them so uh, thank you for sharing that I love that there's um in terms of visions there's Mm. like a very famous like vision on film I think of what of what um Jasmine does so have you ever watched the the film Passage to India no I haven't so so it's a a, won loads and loads of awards in the 1980s an English film I remember it but so, so, okay, so it is known. Um, so the story is of this very demure Edwardian uh, uh, lady and her daughter who go to India. And of course, she has this sexual awakening while she's there. But the sexual awakening is not awoken by people as such. It's mm-hmm. by the land, you mm-hmm. know. And I always think of like, uh, she, she's seeing, she's going to these temples and you've got all these erotic, it's eroticism everywhere and the scent of, of India. And I always think that that's a very like um, a jasmine thing, you know, that you can, you almost get transported. And oh. of course, mm-hmm. the, when we think about, for me, uh, the, there's always got to be a, a like a, an acknowledgement that essentials are conversations they're bottles of conversations between plants and insects that's what they are whether that says come ha- come you know come be my genitals or do not nibble my leaves anymore or we fuck off from my lo- roots that's what they are <laughs> yeah. um and so and with jasmine is very much an evening conversation mm-hmm. you know the, the scent is designed to lure the moths under the moon you know that she is the moon goddess so yes. that's really lovely how everybody sees you don't need to be taught that you feel that you, when, you, when, you, when you pick it up you do and that's being attuned to them i i love 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 that right we're definitely having more conversations and <laughs> storytelling and um i absolutely love that i'm so grateful that this happened and I just want to share one thing that came to me about the bees as well and I remember three decades ago when I was studying my diploma of aromatherapy and it was a warm sunny muggy day in Sydney and um, we had the rooms of the uh, the windows of the lecture room open and when we would do blending and that it was funny bees always used to come in Oh, they do know. And you know what, as well, I'm not not saying for certain, but but drone bees, and I don't know why this is. And and, but funnily enough, my son said something very similar the other day when, because obviously we have beehives in the garden now, we don't know. We we didn't before, but we do now. And he says, Mother Bee just came and sat on my arm. And I said, well, like a bumblebee. And he went, no, like a honeybee. And I went, were you frightened? And he went, no. I was fascinated. I went, oh, that was a drone. When I was writing the book, 
drone bees quite often used to come and sit on my arm and just look at me. Now, if you there's a fantastic bee shamanism book called Songs of Unity by a lady called uh, Jacqueline Freeman. And she, like me, hears the bees speak, but she hears them in a much more beautiful way than I do. And she, they talk about the different songs that they have. Now, she says that the drone, that the bees have told her that the drones are the ones that go out and collect information about the environment and take it into the hives. So I got this like, and I was like, oh, so it was like the bees had sent a messenger to go, what's she doing? How's she getting on? What's she writing? <laughs> that was um, a fascinating thing. <laughs> So love that. I adore bees. I just love them. And here the bumblebees are fluffy and they're brown and yellow. In New Zealand, they're really fluffy and they're black and yellow. I think more like the English ones. And it's and then we have these ones that are blue bands. Oh, I used to love them. They have this iridescent blue across their you know, their um, bottom part of their body. I'm, I can't remember anatomically scopa. what their names are. The scopa and the thorax. So the, so the thorax is the part of the body. The scopa is the fluffy stuff, which is obviously designed to collect the pollen. To collect the pot pollen, yeah. I just, I love bees. And when I lived in the country, I just used to love sitting, watching them. And, and it never bothered me because the mud wasps used to fly and I used to watch them because they're, they're not an aggressive bee, and they'd have a little clump of wet mud in their feet, held in their feet, and they'd fly and they'd look for the next part of our, like, log house where they could put their, build their little mud nests for their babies, and I used to quite love it. And we have these weeny, weeny, weeny little native bees here. They're tiny, tiny, and... Um, I find that in summer, like, they do get inside because I have my doors, even though I've got screen doors, they can get through the screens because they're so tiny and they're so cute. So I'm always catching them and having conversations with them and putting them outside. So bees are, uh, well, we know. I would like to think that everybody knows, but they don't, um, how necessary they are for our earth like so many other insects but bees are beautiful and honey and mm. on that note I think I'm going to <laughs> to finish this off and um, what a fabulous conversation and I look forward to more Elizabeth I'm so happy to be able to even see your face because I'm recording this on on zoom because i like to look at the people that i'm talking to so thank you thank you for being here and we'll we'll do another one soon yes well it's early here in england i hope my day carries on like this all day because this was a beautiful start to my day thank you so much julie i've loved it thank you and to our audience have no fear elizabeth's information will be in the show notes and we do look forward to having her again. No pressure, of course, but I will be on her back. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to say goodbye and see you on our next episode. And thank you all for being here. Thank you for joining us on the enchanting journey through the realms of magic, mystique and self-discovery. I hope you enjoyed our time together on the Rich Witch Podcast, where we delve into the depths of witchcraft, astrology and the unapologetic rise of women. Please subscribe, rate and leave a review. And as we wrap up, I encourage you to carry the wisdom and magic we've shared into your own life. Embrace the power within you and revel in the beauty of your own unique journey. Stay tuned for more magic and in the meantime, stay curious and know your magic is a gift to the world. Blessed be beautiful ones and remember the magic is always within you. This is Julie Nelson signing off.